Okay, we will now switch gears and um, we will go uh, from the graduate student competition to our invited speakers. And our first presenter is uh, Dr. Reynold Bergen. Reynold is the science director for the Beef Cattle Research Council for the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. In that position, he coordinates research priorities and funding between uh, beef and cattle research funders and the Beef Cattle Research uh, Council. Uh, works very closely with producer groups across the country and is very involved in extending uh, research information to producers uh, that is um, uh, generated through the Beef Cattle Research Council and through other organizations. He holds degrees from both the University of Saskatchewan as well as the University of Guelph. And the title of his presentation is Animal Welfare Issues and Initiatives in Canada's Beef Industry. Please join me in welcoming Reynold to the podium. Thanks, John. So far, so good. All right, I'm going to plunge right into this. I'm According to my watch, which isn't terribly reliable, I'm starting 10 minutes early, and I've got a lot of slides, so I should be able to get us back on track here. <laughs> now, there's a lot of things that I could talk about, and I'm not going to talk about a lot of them, mainly because more knowledgeable people have already talked about them here today. Now, the exception to this is I'm going to talk a fair bit about transportation, because that's a, that's a big issue. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to, to add to it, reiterate some of what Karen said and add to it a little bit as well. But that said, I'm also going to repeat a few other things that were said. And one, one of them is that, that there's a real big issue here in that over 90% of people in North America are at least three generations removed from the farm. And so if you think about this a little bit, that means that they didn't grow up on a farm their parents didn't grow up on a farm, maybe their grandparents didn't even grow up on a farm, or at least they left it. So what that means is that there's a lot of people in society right now who have absolutely no connection at all to primary agriculture. They've never gone to visit their grandparents on the farm in summer. And, and that's a real important issue because if these people have absolutely no first-hand knowledge at all of livestock production, but if they also have some real questions and concerns about animal welfare, where do they go to get information? And, and, and there's a lot of information out there on the internet, but it's not all accurate. I think most people likely know that modern agriculture, somewhere between old McDonald's farm and what the extremist groups would have them believe, but, but if they have no first-hand knowledge, and if there's not a lot of real good information out there, the urban population out there, especially the urban, but even some of the rural public, is much more susceptible to some of the uh, sensational stories that come out that, that misrepresent or greatly exaggerate some of the things that go on in, in modern agriculture. Um, so, you know, this has contributed to this large and growing gulf of confusion that other speakers have, have mentioned to, or, or, or uh, referred to, between what the beef industry does and what it's perceived to be doing. And, and, and there's a lot of mixed messages and, and confusing messages out there for people. That was Terry Whiting, by the way. The other thing to point out is that, uh, most people realize this, is that, that rare catastrophes or really, really spectacular acts of negligence are newsworthy. You know, you think about the space program, they've spent many, many, many years doing some really, really valuable research up in space and learning lots about the cosmos, but you blow up a rocket or two and that's when they make the headlines. Same thing with agriculture. You know, one major, this is, this is a reference to the, to the Westland Hallmark case in the States, but if this is the only time that the beef industry makes the news, that's the image that some people are going to be left with. And that is what brings us to livestock transport. Other people, um, notably Travis and Karen, both mentioned to, or uh, referred to this, so I'm, I'm glad they're, they're picking up on, on, on what I've been saying, is that, that, that People who are living in cities, if they see livestock on any particular day, chances are those livestock are in a transport trailer going somewhere. 
That's their impression of, of the livestock industry, and that's what makes it a really, really important issue for consumers, for industry, for regulators, for activist groups. And Karen made reference to the fact that, that letters to the minister from the general public about, about livestock production are by and large focusing on transportation. There's a lot of concern around there. And so it's really, really important that we get this done right and that, and that the truth of, of what actually goes on get, gets out there. So I took this picture and this is actually about two blocks down from where I took the picture of Terry. Um, but the, the, the point here is, I mean, we've got a nice, this is a pretty clean livestock truck. It happened to be empty, but, but you know, the, there's a lot of people probably driving through McDonald's to get their morning coffee and this is their dose of, of the livestock industry for the day. I'm going to talk about, a little bit about BSE because one of the things industry likes to say, and it's true to a large extent, that is that good commerce is good welfare. These animals are really, really valuable, so we take good care of them so that they'll grow and they'll make money. And that is true. The challenge gets to be is that some animals are more valuable than others. And we need to provide the same standard of care for these less valuable animals than, than we do, or as we do, to the ones that are highly valuable. And this gets to be even more of a challenge when commerce itself is compromised, like we saw through BSE. And so the question is, when in, during BSE, especially early on, when, when, when cattle prices were completely depressed in Canada, were, were uh, cow-calf producers and feeders and transporters cutting corners on animal welfare. The big concern here is with cull cows, market cows, um, and not, not to insult anyone's intelligence, but, but back in 2002, Canada was exporting about 50% of the beef and cattle we produced. And so when that border closed in May, we suddenly got a real reminder about some of the potential dynamics of supply and demand economics. We had a huge mountain of beef and cattle piling up in Canada with not enough people to eat it. Fortunately, the border opened to bone in youthful beef in fall, so some of that stuff started to go, which was good. The packers kept functioning, they kept bringing in youthful cattle and processing them but there wasn't a lot of value to mature cows because we couldn't export any of that stuff and there's a limit to how much Canadians can actually eat. So, so the value of beef from mature cows was very low and the value of market cows was extremely low in Canada. And so as a result of this, a lot of these cows weren't going to market at all. They were staying on the farm. And, and that, that was a good thing, but there started to be some real concerns that, that these cows that are staying at home are getting older. And by the time they do go to market, they could be in, in, in less than optimal condition for transport. So in 2004, I believe it was, a number of the provincial groups started working on developing humane handling guidelines. So these were guidelines that applied to all animals, but with a real focus on particular um, precautions and care that, that, that need to be taken when you're making a decision as to whether or not you're going to load an animal that may be compromised. And that's everything from, you know, cancer eyes to thin animals to broken legs, which should never, ever get on a tra trailer. It's illegal to do so. So those are some of the things that were pointed out. So the whole key was, there's lots of pictures in there. If you see this condition, this is what it is, this is how you should deal with it. And these handling guidelines were developed in Alberta, they were developed in Saskatchewan, these are both quite similar. And then Ontario had, had their own, there were similar initiatives across the country. These were all spearheaded by the, by the provincial beef groups and together very, very closely with the provincial farm animal care groups that, are, that, that do a huge service to, to all livestock industries across the country. So that helped. Industry about the same time also developed what was called a certified livestock transport program in, in Canada. And the point of this was really to recognize the fact that there are a lot of new drivers, young inexperienced drivers entering the, the trucking industry and they need to know that some of the physiological requirements and legal requirements that, that pertain to hauling livestock are a little bit different than, than the ones that, that may pertain to hauling coke or shingles, right? And so this program was developed in Alberta in uh, the mid-2000s. It's now delivered nationally. 
some packers in Canada on, will only accept loads of cattle from drivers who have been trained through the CLT program, so that's encouraged uptake among the, the packing companies, or the, the trucking companies as well, which is good, and it's also recognized as equivalent in, uh, in the states, equivalents with the master cattle transporter program there. CFIA played a really key role here as well, because it, it, the producer groups and fax groups can try all they want, but it, there's always some producers who we can't reach. The regulatory agencies have, have a role to play here as well. And like any good regulatory agency, their first approach is communication. Inform producers and truckers about what the law is, what their responsibilities are. And so they had a lot of messaging out there that was pretty consistent with what we had. Um, there's a BSE surveillance program that was going on that was instrumental in this as well, which I'm not going to talk about. If you want to ask questions, feel free. And ultimately, when things go wrong, they've got a role in enforcement. Their, their role, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, they're responsible for the health of animals regulations in Canada, and livestock transport falls under that. So anyway, they had a big, big role to play too. In 2008, which is when the border was finally open to OTM, over 30 month mature cow beef and cows, when those animals and beef started to flow across the border, suddenly the price went up, right? Because there's more markets that we could sell this stuff to. Price went up, so then industry was, was concerned that, okay, now some of these old cows may start coming out of the woodwork and heading to town. This was also after the Hallmark Westland thing happened, so we were very, very well aware of what the consequences of bad loading, transport, and, and management decisions could be. And so we used all those previous resources and, and we ramped it up a little bit, started to do some pretty overt messaging about the fact that old, thin, weak animals should be humanely euthanized on the farm, they should not be loaded for transport, either for sale or for slaughter got a little bit more pointed than that and said, don't do anything that you're not willing to explain on the national news and always act like somebody might be watching because they could be. And, and uh, do I sound nervous to you? I sound really nervous to me. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, and, and that, that, that message really resonated with a lot of producers because the, most producers have cell phones and have smartphones and, and so they get that, that it's really, really easy to take pictures and movies of, of, of things at any place at any time. So, so this was a pretty effective message, I think. Anyway, some other industry initiatives that were really, really effective as well was that the Packers, in early in BSE, they started to really, really strictly enforce load limits on loads arriving at their packing plants. They had some, they had some, some, uh, a, a couple of motivations for this. One was they wanted to avoid bruising, and they wanted to avoid trampling, and they wanted to avoid harassment by the regulatory people. And so they said, do not deliver anything that's loaded at a density that exceeds CFI recommendations. And if you do, we won't take your cattle next time. Same with arrival times. If we tell you to be here at 1 o'clock to deliver cattle, don't show up at 9 and hope to jump the queue, because we're not going to take your cattle anymore. And, and that sort of message flows back really quite quickly. Another thing they did in 2007, and this was largely around the enhanced feed ban in Canada, which is a pretty costly thing, but they started to charge people if, if, if truckers or, or feedlots or cow-calf people, whoever, delivered an animal that ended up getting condemned for any reason, they would deduct $300 off the check they sent the producer which was a pretty good incentive to think twice about loading animals that maybe shouldn't be loaded. Auction, then auction marts did a very similar thing. When, when pack or buyers started to be hesitant about buying these, these not so great cattle at auction marts, auction marts started to charge people 150 bucks for, for destroying and disposing of cows that would not sell. The real key thing here is that if the CFIA gives you a ticket, you can appeal it. If you get a deduction from your auction mart or the packer, there's no appeal process for this. So this message, this, this really, really resonates. I'm going to, well, Karen talked ad nauseum about her, 
about her research. And it was really, really good research. And, and at the time, I was working for ABP, and we worked really closely with her to, to get the thing underway. And, and this, this has been a really, really good study for us. But I'm not going to talk about a bunch of the details, except for this part. This, these outcomes, where she found in the short haul st uh, part of the project and in the long haul part of the project, that 99.98 or 99.95 percent of the cattle were reaching their destination with no apparent problems. The reason that, that this is really, really important is that industry is always advocating for outcome based regulations. And the reason why these numbers are really important is that it might be very, very difficult to come up with a prescriptive, one-size-fits-all regulatory amendment to improve things for the remaining 0.05 or 0.02 percent of animals that doesn't inadvertently make things potentially worse for the ones that are coming off in good condition now. Yeah, that's been talked about. And we're supporting some of the ongoing research that's looking at, at the high-risk group she did identify, which were the wean calves and market cows. I'm not going to talk about that one much. I am going to talk about this. Um, Transport-related condemnations. The CFIA does, does report the numbers of animals that are condemned for a whole variety of reasons. What I've done here is added together the condemnations that are due to deads, downers and carcasses that are condemned due to extreme bruising. And the point, where's my pointer gone? Anyway, the point I want to make is the big red bar there is the pre-BSE average. That average is around 0.024% of cattle at federally and provincially inspected packing plants were condemned for those three transport related reasons. During the BSE years 2003 through 2008-9, those numbers never exceeded the pre-BSE average. I think this is a good thing. That's especially good when you consider that in 2009, 10, and 11, we had a huge influx of, of market cows going for slaughter. The point here is that the prevalence of negative transport outcomes did not increase for Canadian cattle, even when economics were extremely challenging. Those, this graph that I showed you here is, uh, and, and the result or the reason for this is that, that we had a, prop, a contributing factor was the fact that we had some really effective um, combination of producer education and, and regulatory enforcement. Um, now, the important thing here is that this isn't a subset, this isn't a sample, this reflects every animal that was slaughtered in Canada over that entire 12 year period. So, so there's nothing selective about this. The other thing I want to point out is the scale, oh, my pointer's back, the scale of the y-axis here, this is 0.03%. So this isn't 0.03 out of 1, this is 0.03 out of 100. So there are very, 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 very few negative transport outcomes arriving at our federally and provincially inspected packing plants. One more thing I want to talk about. Beef industry quite often is thinking about this highly valuable finished beef animal that, that, that produces this wonderful beef that Joe and, and uh, company lovingly prepared for us last night. But, but we also, and hopefully you can see this, this is a, a very washed out image of a, of a market cow. This is the, the ideal beef animal that we produce, but we've also got market cows, market beef cows that are coming to slaughter after 8 to 14 years of productive life. We need to pay very close attention and provide them with the same standard of care and transport as we do to those fat cattle. The other thing I want to point out is that she also becomes a beef cattle, beef animal, after her four years of productive life. We got some regional differences in Canada. In the West, we have about 94% of our cow herd is beef cows, about 6% is dairy. In the east, so this, that's the prairie provinces in, in BC. Ontario east, it's closer to 50-50 beef and dairy. The big issue happening now is that there's one large plant in eastern Canada that's been handling almost all of Canada's cows, and that plant recently suspended operations due to finances. Those cows are now going to be traveling an awful lot farther. So that plant is located in Montreal. They're now possibly going to be going to Toronto or Guelph. There's a couple of packing plants that may take some of them. That's 
around 600 kilometers away. The other likely candidate plant is in the U.S. in Wyalusing, Pennsylvania, and that's another 600 kilometer drive. So the slaughter capacity thing that, that Travis was talking about the first night, we really don't want to lose slaughter capacity in Canada, and that's partly from, and you know, the industry needs this sort of thing to be a, a, a competitive, competitive industry, but there's also some welfare implications to this. This loss of slaughter capacity is particularly troublesome when it's increasing the transport distances for market cows. A couple of years ago, we had a packing plant south of here in Moose Jaw, and it handled a lot of market cows from, from uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and it closed down. So those cattle were going an extra 500 kilometers to get to Brooks or another 700 kilometers to get to, to Calgary. A lot of this communication, I think, that, that industry was doing at the time around the importance of making proper loading and transport and management decisions, culling decisions early on, all uh, together with CFIA messaging and enforcement likely helped to avoid some of the problems in that case. And we think some of this messaging, well, we know that, that, that our industry messaging is going to be ramped up and focused towards Ontario and, and Eastern Canada. Um, starting now, but especially this fall as the, as the fall cow run picks up, and I suspect that some of that messaging may also be of some value to the dairy industry, and some of those discussions between CFIA and dairy farmers and CCA have already started, so hopefully we can help out there too. I'm not done. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about animal handling. There's been a, a lot of talk over the years about, you know, the good ways to handle cattle. You, you know, handle them calmly, quietly. Make sure your equipment's well designed and maintained. Importance of having trained employees. Travis showed this the other night. I made it bounce because that's where the bruises come from. The uh, what we see here, the first. 1995 is the first time Canada did a beef quality audit, and they found nearly 80% of fed cattle, these were the valuable ones, had bruises. In the wake of that first beef quality audit, they developed a program called Quality Starts Here, which was partly food safety, but a lot, a lot of uh, just good production practices. How do we, things you can improve as a producer to minimize carcass damage and various other things. And one of the big things was on proper handling to avoid this sort of thing. Within three years, we saw a pretty major reduction in bruising. Then we didn't do quality audits for a couple of years during BSE. We were preoccupied with other things. We just finished another audit. This is a really pre preliminary number, but bruising is continuing to go down. That's good. Also seeing a lot fewer animals with multiple bruises. It was 50% the first time. Now it's dropping. It's well below 10 now, which is which is on par with what they've been reporting in the States. I suspect they'll have another blue dot to show up here soon, which will be good. Rumen health is an ongoing issue, or a, it's an ongoing concern. And it's, it's a really interesting one because everybody's really concerned about rumen health, especially from the activist point of view, but it's something that's really, really hard to quantify in, in practice. So industries had a lot of messages about the importance of developing a finishing diet in conjunction with a nutritionist or veterinarian. Make sure you're avoiding abrupt changes in diets, especially abrupt increases in the amount of grain they're getting fed. Adjust rations based on animal intake behavior. I'm going to start screaming if you people don't start waking up. And, and changes in the weather. Um, and make, make sure that you're mixed. Maybe I shouldn't talk in a monotone. That would help. Um, mix, mix and deliver feed consistently so that the... the, that the uh, diet that, that animals are, are, are eating from day to day is, is consistent. That's what industry's been recommending. Of course, the concern is trying to avoid acidosis, whether it's subacute or acute. The problem is that it's really, really difficult to objectively measure this on an ongoing basis in production situations. And so typically we've relied on liver abscess scores as a proxy indicator about what might have happened at some point during the animal's life. And, and that's admittedly less than optimal. The other issue we got here is there's a lot of acidosis research that's been done, and it's been really good research, but just out of necessity, a lot of this has been intensive metabolic studies using fistulated animals are often housed individually and, and fed once per day. You get some valuable information out of this, but we do need to, to, to keep in mind that we're lacking data on rumen pH in commercial situations where cattle might be fed more frequently and are certainly going to be influenced more by, by large group um, feeding behavior. So um, 
yeah, Greg Penner is going to talk. He knows a lot more about this than me, and he's doing the research. We're helping to support some of it. So it'll be really, really interesting to see what comes out of this. And I'll let him speak for himself later on. Dehorning and branding. I think, I'm not sure. I think Travis mentioned this the other night. So industry's been recommending dehorn them at an early age because it's probably less stressful, probably less painful, and they are going to recover more quickly. If you're doing it in mature animals, talk to your veterinarian before you do it and follow their instructions. When branding's required, do it expertly, quickly, proper equipment, always with a trained person using the right techniques. And quality audit will help us here figure out what's going on as well. We're seeing a lot less horns. Now this is actually not, when I've, this number here is, is prevalence of fed cattle with horns. The, the current quality audit actually indicated that over 85% of the fed cattle entering Canada's um, slaughter plants now are polled. So they, don't, they never had horns. These weren't cattle that were dehorned. These were animals that never had horns, which is a good thing. Branding is getting to be less common. It used to be nearly 70%. It's down to about 10% of fed cattle with brands right now. Again, these are preliminary numbers, and hopefully we'll get them, get them finalized in the next few weeks. Dehorning and branding, <coughs> they're a good one because there's economic incentives to drive this, right? Nobody wants horns because nobody wants bruising. Nobody wants to get hurt. Nobody wants their other animals to get hurt either. Nobody wants brands because they want big chunks of leather to put in your Cadillacs that you're all driving. All right. there, it takes a lot less labor to not dehorn or brand. It's not a pleasant thing to do. And especially on the dehorning side, there are serious consequences to animal productivity when you're dehorning them later in life. Castration, industry's been recommending for years and years, do it at an early age for the same reason. They're gonna recover sooner, it might hurt less, it's certainly less of a, a, a wound to recover from. Make sure that you know what you're doing. Make sure they're using well-maintained equipment. Do it quickly. If you're doing mature animals, talk to your vet. Now, castration, I don't have a graph. I was tempted to make one. Because um, we know that castration still impacts at least 50% of our commercial cattle sometime in their life. We know it hurts. And there is evidence that some of these pain control drugs can reduce the behavioral and physiological responses to castration in feedlot cattle. The issue is that we're recommending that you do them as calves. And if industry recommendations are followed, and they aren't always followed, but if they're followed, then castration at the feedlot shouldn't be an issue. So the question then becomes, what is the welfare impact of castrating young beef calves? There's been a lot of research done on this, but a lot of it's focused on dairy calves that have been weaned at birth and hand-fed. And that's a really, really, really effective way at separating the stress or pain of castration from the stress response from maternal separation and handling. The problem is that in commercial beef production, the maternal separation and the castration are completely, completely confounded. And there's been very little research where they've actually tried to look at this. And the one that I've been able to find, and there might be more, if you do know, more, know about more, please come and let me know. But, but there's been a real, real lack of research trying to look at the effects of castration in pre-wean beef calves. Brenda King, the late Brenda King, who I used to share an office with here um, years ago, took years off my life. Anyway, she, she and Roger Cohen and Cheryl Gunther, who used to work at Termundi, did, did one project trying to look at this and I'm, quite a few years ago, 25 years ago nearly. They had 120, 142 crossbred bull calves. They castrated half of them at about two and a half months of age, the other half about two and a half months later. They compared surgical branding to Berdizo, or surgical castration, to Berdizo to a sham control what they did was they pulled these calves away from the dam, they did their castration, they blood sampled them for cortisol, they returned them to the dam, and then they re-sampled the cortisol 3, 6, 12, 24, 30 hours later. What they found was that the cortisol response was lower in the younger calves than the older ones, which kind of lines up with industry messages. It's probably less stressful to do them in younger calves. The really, really 
surprising thing to me was that this cortisol response didn't differ between the different castration or sham treatments. The cortisol response was just as high throughout this entire period in the control calves as it was in the surgi surgical or berdizo castrates, both at the 70 days, um, or the, the two and a half month group as well as the five month castration group. And so what this indicates is that the stress response from the maternal separation and handling obscured the stress response to castration. And that's not just me saying that. This is what the author said. They said, our data suggests that removal from the dam and restraint of the young calves during the castration process caused as much or more immediate stress than castration per se. Now, this was done a long time ago. They did not do any behavioral observations. We know that stress isn't the same as pain, and we know that cortisol probably isn't an ideal indicator of pain. So there, there's some holes in this study, but this is as close as I could come to, to research where they've tried to do this in a, as close to production setting as possible. Anyway, this hole in, in our knowledge is, has contributed to, we just did a call for proposals. And some of our priority research outcomes that we wanted researchers to address um, were very focused on welfare issues around pain. And one of them was to develop practical, cost-effective methods of objectively quantifying and mitigating pain and stress in beef cattle under production conditions. Another was <clears throat> to develop benchmarks to understand the additive effects of beef production practices on pain, stress, immunity, and health. And the third one was to develop a scientifically valid beef cattle welfare audit program. Our call for proposals ended last week, and I looked at the titles of the, the welfare-related ones really, really quickly last night, and there, it looks to me like there's at least six of them where groups of researchers have really tried to, to come up with, with proposals that, that'll address these, these priority outcomes. So, so it'll be uh, interesting to delve into those further and see if we can get some of that stuff underway. You know, we've got this code of practice, Travis referred to that. Um, it was originally developed back in 1991. It's currently under revision. Um, industry, again, is looking to have, a, five minutes? Oh good, I can probably get done. Um, industry wants to have a scientifically sound outcome-based code and hopefully that some of this research that's been done and some of the research that, that is going to be going will contribute to, to continuing scientific, um, scientifically informed code. Um, so I think I'm wrapping up now. I think uh, to say animal welfare has always been a priority for beef produ producers. Sometimes it's also an economic imperative, but it's always the right thing to do. And uh, the beef industry has repeatedly demonstrated that it will respond positively to sound animal welfare communication. Done. Thank you. <laughs>